So we are going to transition into interjurisdictional dynamics, I think dynamics, amongst Yukon First Nations and non-Indigenous governance during the COVID-19 pandemic. My friend, <laughs> yes, my friend Allison and my friend Carrie are going to join us. You're in for a real treat. Uh, Carrie, are you online? There she is. Awesome. I'm going to turn it over to you amazing ladies. You're going to see me slip out of this room because I have to go and prepare for the next part of it. So when you're finished with this presentation, join us in the longhouse. There's some really good prizes, but you don't get them if you're not in the room. Okay, take it away, Allison and Carrie. Hey, I think Carrie's gonna get us started. Oh, there we go. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and I've just lost my slide deck, so just give me a second here. There we go. Um, hi, everybody. I'm joining in from the traditional territory of Champaign and Ajac First Nations in beautiful Dakwakata Hinge Junction, which is where I live and work and play. So thank you very much for having me. And I'm here with my colleague, Alison Perrin, uh, who will be presenting as well. Uh, so we're talking today about interjurisdictional dynamics amongst Yukon First Nations and non-Indigenous governments during the COVID-19 pandemic. I, I heard Tosh joke a couple of times like, ah, COVID's over and we hate COVID. And we sure do, but I think it's important for us to learn as much as we can from what happened during the pandemic. And I was just soaking in so much of what Asia was saying in that last presentation, because those socioeconomic data points, all of those things, like we need to have them in place so that we're collecting good data in advance of the next pandemic, in advance of the next major mine, in advance of anything that's coming. Because one of the challenges we had during the pandemic was access to good, reliable data at the community level, reflecting First Nation experience. And, and it just wasn't there. And we need to find and solve ways to to, to have that going forward. So we're, we're more resilient as we face the next pandemic. This project came together as part of Yukon First Nations COVID response um, and the Council of Yukon First Nations and uh, what is now One Yukon Coalition. One Yukon Coalition is a body that is now holding a lot of that knowledge from Yukon First Nations COVID response, a new NGO that's going to take all of those lessons learned, what's in this report and implement solutions so we don't lose track of of what we learned during the pandemic. I wanna extend my gratitude as well to Rhiannon Klein and to Kiri Staples who were uh, co-researchers in this project as well. And as well, of course, um, the Alatini who was uh, the lead of Yukon First Nations COVID response. Uh, so at a high level, our sort of project goals were to understand the, per the perspectives and experiences of Yukon First Nation governments and organizations, as well as other go governments in the territory uh, around what they experienced in terms of that interjurisdictional dynamic um, during COVID-19. Uh, we, uh, we analyzed a whole bunch of different data sources that, that were available to us including um, the conversations that were had at U Conversations caucus calls, as well as um, our relationships with um, people who are working in COVID response in First Nation governments, municipal governments, and Yukon government. Uh, Yukon government. We took all of those different data points and these a, a series of interviews that took shape over the course of the pandemic um, into in through a process which we called the in action review. And so basically we took um, the guidelines that the World Health Organization produced during the pandemic on how to debrief pandemics while they were happening and applied that uh, structure to the Yukon and, and use that as our framework, as well as sort of bringing in all these other data points. Um, so we took these transcripts, we um, analyzed them and found sort of our, our sort of key sort of themes that emerged during, during that analysis as well as we had some legal input and review from uh, Darren Lees and Helena uh, and um, produced a final report, which we'll sh be sharing with you today. And so whenever we were doing our um, 
interact in action reviews on the pandemic, we always began with what was your first memory of the pandemic? It seems like forever ago. I mean, it, it, it seems almost like a distant memory now in many ways. Um, but for many, it was the declaration of the World Health Organization. For some, it was the cancellation of basketball. For others, it was the toilet paper crisis. Um, there, there are sort of so many different things that sort of come to mind when you're thinking about the, the beginning of the pandemic and, and what sort of uh, started it all. In order to kind of chart how we saw the pandemic over the last three years, we developed what we called uh, sort of our timeline of events. And this is based on the experience that we observed from Yukon First Nations COVID response. Yukon First Nations COVID response came together with chief's caucus calls with the chief medical officer of health and government officials, um, sometimes twice a week during the pandemic and then sometimes more like monthly. There was also Yukon First Nations COVID response communication working group and that working group met weekly and then moved to bi-weekly throughout the whole pandemic. So this timeline is really the culmination of the experience of those collaborative spaces. And we saw sort of these different phases of pandemic response. And we cheekily call the first the four months of the pandemic the oh crap, we're in a pandemic phase where really we're all just sort of scrambling and trying to figure out what's what and how to proceed. And then we move into that sort of first spring and summer, which is our first reopening of 2020. And then we transition to what we realize is going to be our new normal for a period of time as we reopen our schools um, in September 2020. And that's when we saw the first death here in the territory. And, and that's really because we had closed borders and limited access into the territory with um, required isolation to, to help keep COVID at bay. Uh, then we move into the vaccine phase, which we are all very grateful to receive the vaccine in such great number and in such um, rapid response and being able to move that out across the territory very quickly. And then as we um, enter into graduation season, uh, summer 2021, we experience our first real wave of COVID-19 um, as you know, hundreds of Yukoners are found to be in isolation during the pandemic. After that, on the um, insistence of chiefs, uh, we look to find new ways to bring testing to the people. And that's why Yukon First Nations COVID response and Yukon First Nation governments were the first to bring rapid antigen tests to the general population. And that happened in the fall of 2021, immediately after we saw the tremendous impact of the pandemic uh, within the First Nation communities. And then, of course, we had Omicron enter the scene, which basically collapses the testing infrastructure across the country. Uh, and so you see the precipitous drop there in the number of cases that are uh, being reported because they're no longer being tested. Um, and then we enter into the phase of living with COVID-19. And so just moving to the next slide, and I just want to sort of echo again on what Asia was talking about when it comes to data. One of the things that we were able to access with a tremendous amount of advocacy during the first real wave of the pandemic was data on the impact of the pandemic on First Nation um, indigenous populations here in the territory. And so during that first real wave, we saw that 56% of the cases, 63% of the hospitalizations, 56% of medevacs, and 50% of the deaths here in the territory, uh, territory were within the indigenous population. And given that only 22% of the territory identifies as indigenous, I, I mean, it was obviously greatly disproportionately affecting the, the indigenous community. Uh, and now I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Allison to talk about sort of the, the lessons learned. I'm going to walk you through some of the results and key findings from our project. And in the final report, there are tangible recommendations for each of these key findings. Um, these are shared on the slide with illustrative quotes. Uh, I just want to note that where names are shared, we were given permission to share them. And this so much has happened since then that there's been turnover and change. So some of the people um, have moved out of their positions 
but we listed them with their position at the time because that is um, what they represented when we when we talked with them. So early on, uh, the COVID YFN COVID response team was developed at CYFN. Mathia was hired to coordinate between First Nation governments, YG, and the federal government. And Carrie was the main point of contact for First Nation employees looking for supplies and information. And this was critical throughout the pandemic. We heard this consistently in all of our inaction reviews, and it contributed to collaboration between First Nation governments, but also between First Nation governments and YG. It also strengthened existing relationships. We found that a formal body and processes are necessary to coordinate planning and response amongst Yukon First Nations in a wide scale, wide scale emergency. And we recommend that this type of position and this type of formal body be carried forward and that those roles and responsibilities be formalized to support relationship building and collaboration between Yukon First Nations and also with YG. And you can think about this in terms of COVID response, but also emergency response or, or other types of collaborative decision making that needs to happen. I can barely see you with these, but there we go. Okay. Um, Early in the pandemic, there were examples of good relationships with the CMOH and Aboriginal relations that supported Yukon First Nations. Those relationships built from regular communication, so ongoing meetings, phone calls, community visits. Champions within a variety of organizations supported those relationships. Those champions were critical. However, those relationships weren't uniform throughout the pandemic and with all YG branches, and this led to challenges when communication wasn't consistent. We found that interjurisdictional collaboration, so collaboration between different governments, is critical for emergency planning and response, and it's really dependent on good, consistent communication. As well, we found that rural and Yukon First Nation communities have unique considerations that need to be considered during emergency planning and response. Yet there were examples of communities there were examples of communities rallying together in some towns the first nations and municipality worked together to respond sometimes coming together in a committee with local rcmp and other organizations in the community there were also really good examples of good relationships being strengthened between yukon first nations and sharing experiences and approaches and collaborating to build off each other's strengths Um, we heard earlier today, and this was something that we heard through our project, uh, that Yukon First Nations need access to data as soon as it is available, but also to technical guidance and plain language information to make decisions for their citizens. So lack of access to data, in particular First Nations specific data, was an issue throughout the pandemic. Um, and it affected how First Nations could respond to care for their citizens. Um, I think that quote is really powerful. It, it did not allow First Nations to have the information, the data, the knowledge that they needed to appropriately respond with the smallest possible footprint. Um, and I think there were also examples of this relationship starting to grow where there's data sharing agreements that are beginning to be formed between YG and some First Nations where that will lead to more data sharing in the future specifically around health data. Uh, unilateral decision-making um, due to kind of a lack of institutional relationships was an issue that emerged from our, our um, inaction reviews. There was this strong relationship in the beginning of the pandemic when everything was happening very quickly and um, there was an eventual breakdown in that relationship between Yukon government and Yukon First Nations. Participants felt that YG started making decisions unilaterally, either giving Yukon First Nations limited time for feedback, um, like delivering them a strategy with a quick turnaround, um, or giving them, or not really, not really giving them time for meaningful feedback. Around the same time, there was a change at the office of the CMOH that impacted Yukon First Nation relationships with that office. Up until then, they had built a trust with 
Dr. Hanley, he had made a point of contacting First Nation leadership personally when there were outbreaks or issues that arose. Um, as we heard today, that trust is something that's slow to build and it's through consistent communication, regular contact. Um, and this highlights how those relationships are often dependent on specific in individuals and they're not institutional. So in order to build institutional relationships, there needs to be respect for First Nation self-determination, recognition that this is a nation to nation relationship um, and that contributes to improved relationships and effective collaboration. But it also requires coordination. So this means people in those roles or structures that can help to bring and foster those relationships. Uh, it can include things like training for senior leaders and administrators so they have a, a more thorough understanding of self-government agreements. It could be in a liaison position with Yukon government's emergency response unit. And it also means adequate funding for Yukon First Nations to ensure they have self-determining control and direction over their own emergency response. Um, we also heard that Yukon First Nations needed access to information and sometimes someone to translate technical health information into plain language. Often it was the CMOH that played that role, particularly in the first year of the pandemic, but also in some cases community nurses took on that role. And there were some good examples of relationships where community nurses would either come to council and explain some of uh, the information that was coming out. Um, we found that the role of the CM CMOH is critical in supporting Yukon First Nations, but it's dependent on having a champion in the position. So having uh, more training for the CM CMOH and other health positions was one of the recommendations. Um, and working with Yukon First Nations to improve relationships, but also collaborating together, spending time in the communities and making a, a strong commitment to those relationships with Yukon First Nation governments. There were multiple examples of Yukon First Nations leading the way in their communities during the pandemic, but also in other emergency situations that have arisen in the territory over the past few years. There have been so many. It's been three years of just constant stuff. Um, First Nation-led planning emphasizes community-relevant response measures and ensures that First Nations' ways of knowing, being, and doing are at the forefront of emergency response. There are opportunities to further de develop or expand Yukon First Nation emergency planning and response, but it requires support. Um, there also needs to be mechanisms available for navigating conflicts and relationships between governments. So when one government declares an emergency, how does that impact other governments and how do they respond to that? Um, yeah, and there, there are lots of examples of Yukon First Nation and municipalities working together on this emergency planning and response and taking advantage of the strengths of each. Um, but yes, these are uh, areas where there needs to be more support. We heard Mithia mention this morning the need for structures. The relationship between Yukon government and Yukon First Nations started to deteriorate when meetings became less frequent and they didn't have those organizational structures that support ongoing communication, collaboration, and relationship building between different governments. So things like formal agreements, uh, consistent regular meetings, collaborative communication strategy that bridges multiple governments. These are structures that can contribute to better collaboration. Um, there are opportunities for emergency response in the Yukon to reflect First Nation ways of knowing, doing, and being, um, including in communicating and organizing things like vaccine clinics where community strengths can contribute to success as we saw during the pandemic. There are also lingering questions around jurisdiction in relation to First Nation declaring a state of emergency and the responses that flow from that decision. Self-government agreements provide such powers. However, they are not discussed in SEMA, which currently SEMA is the Civil Emergency Measures Act, and it is up to 
be reviewed in the near future. Um, but it currently does not mention Yukon First Nations or doesn't address those conflicting emergency um, powers. So participants identified the need for Yukon First Nations to be part of the review of SEMA and the decision-making process for updating the legislation through both individual nations and the Council of Yukon First Nations. And that, that legal review needs to consider also that there are self-governing First Nations, but also non-self-governing First Nations that can develop bylaws and also um, uh, have a, an important role in emergency response in their communities. So um, we do have a final report available online um, and some other tools. We created a very visual uh, timeline of everything that happened during the pandemic. If you ever wanna like relive those two years, you can go look at it and there's also a legal briefing note around the review of the Civil Emergency Measures Act, um, and also a, an info sheet for you and your communities if you're interested to understand the Civil Emergency Measures Act. So I wanna thank you for uh, listening today at the end of the day. That was, uh, that was fantastic and I can't wait, and I, I say this with, Honesty, I can't wait to read the final report because I've been waiting for it. So that's exciting. Questions? Questions, good. Everyone's excited to get to the door prizes. I mean, I don't blame you. There are some kick-ass doors. Oh, I almost made it through the day without swearing. There are some great door prizes, good. There's a, is that a question online? I'm not sure, Stephanie can't say. Spons, last one, okay. Well, Carrie and Allison, thank you so much for that amazing presentation and for your hard work during during and after COVID, even though COVID's not over. During and after the first wave <laughs> of COVID? I don't know. Thank you, you guys so you much. You heard it here first. COVID's not over. <laughs> thank you. Round of applause. Thank you.